Greetings, everybody. It's, um, I can tell you that uh, it's very much an honor. It's absolutely been wonderful to come back here. Um, this is where I grew up. Our son grew up. And if you know, if you have children, when your children grow up, you sort of grow up with them. And so maybe I, but I'm still growing up. And um, so when I was preparing for um, this presentation, you know, you guys are all on the right bus. And so what do I do with a group of people that have already gotten it? You're number one. You're number one in terms of NIDCR grants from NIDCR. You're number one in terms of the whole university grants. And so what can I tell you? And I really don't know. And so I'm glad to see this audience is as diverse as I thought it would be. And so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of things. And it's going to be very broad about NIDCR and where we're going. So I will try and um, hopefully uh, give a little bit to all of you, but it's touching broadly on many themes. So the areas I'm going to just spend some time on are just an overview of NIH, briefly, of where we are right now. Um, one of the things that's on all of our minds um, is fiscal challenges, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the strategic plan that's ongoing right now. And that's from 09 to 013. And so we have a strategic plan. Um, there are four goals outlined in that strategic plan. And it's a relatively good strategic plan because it's very flexible. It's more of an action plan. And as we move forward, we're already starting now in 14. We're planning for 14. And we're maybe thinking of a five to seven year strategic plan. But considering many of the things that are here moving forward, but also adding some things, as well as in the summer and the fall, coming back to all of you and asking you to help us. And we do take the information from the outside community. You don't respond enough. And so you really need to be active in your responses to us. And so the areas of the strategic plan are bringing the best science to bear. Are we going to change that in the next 2014? No, it's going to be the same thing in 2014. The public health challenges, they're significant, and it's an important area to address. And many of you have heard about moving from the translational to the clinical research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, the pipeline and the future generation. So these are all things that we're not going to be changing, just adding to, and there's some new directions that we may be taking. So in terms of the overview, um, I think all of you, maybe some of the students don't realize this, that um, there is an intramural program. Um, and so we not only fund, the NIDCR not only funds outside, but we also have an institute inside with intramural researchers. And that's about 10% of our budget, the whole <coughs> NIH budget. Outside is the major, it's about 80%. But in addition to that, and I think this is an important thing for us as a community, when you talk to your Congress people, when you have your lobby people going out, that we're an economic engine also. So NIH funds 4,000 institutions and over 300,000 scientists and researchers. It's an amazing, amazing workforce that we have as well. And to the University of Michigan, Again, you're one of the top universities, but not number one like NIDCR in terms of research funding. So, but it's quite impressive. So <clears throat> this year, in 2012, the NIH gave birth to a new center. And uh, many of you have heard of this over the years, over the last year. That's the National, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. We're looking for a new director. There's currently an acting director. And really, the goal here is to, from that discovery, moving that discovery into the clinic. And maybe um, you'd say, well, all the institutes do this. Why do we need one institute or center that focuses on this? And I think this, I feel this is a good thing. I feel it's a very positive, it provides visibility to the NIH. As one of our goals is to facilitate and canalize this translational sciences, bearing in mind that the fundamental basic science is the major part of what we do and what NIH funds. 
it's health science. We have to move it to, it to the health of the communities. But about 56% of what we fund is at the basic science level. And that's fundamental, and that's not going away. One of the examples of um, how long it takes us, or how long in the past it's taken us to move that research to the clinic, is one of the areas that has been funded in part by NIDCR. And that's the bone morphogenic proteins. And you've heard, since their early discovery, many, many different things that these bone morphogenic proteins do. But the early discovery that it was recognized as a bone morphogenic proteins to have ability to regenerate, to form ectopic bone, was in 1965. It took 40 years from the discovery to finally get it to the market. And there are, and it's not the ideal compound, and we need to look for more. But look how long it took to get that there. I had some other slides of fast forward of things that we funded moving forward, but I really don't have the time to discuss it. But I do have the statistics on, more recently, going from that early stage of recognizing a signaling pathway or some molecule that may have benefit, it takes about 14 years. That's still too long. In addition to that, and probably worse than it taking 14 years, it would be nice if all those 10,000 compounds ended up over here. But in fact, 95%, huge amount of money, huge amount of investment, and I see the Colgate person taking notes on this, which makes me a little nervous. Um, <laughs> but um, it's kind of sad. We have to move over here. And so we, at the research level, need to partner with our Colgates to make sure they're ready to pick it up to move it to the next stage. So that's an important thing for us. And it's great to see that partnership happening here. So the time has never been better with the sequencing of the human genome and with all these accelerated technologies to move things ahead faster. So what's different? This is different. Science is different. Science has changed. Discoveries are different. And these technologies, the DNA sequencing and getting less expensive, the microarray technology, nanotechnology, new imaging, and this is an area I think dentistry can focus on and do better in both the nanotechs and new imaging. Computational biology, genomic-wide association studies. Yeah, there are issues with data management and how we're going to be doing this, but all these new technologies have really allowed us to move much more rapidly um, than ever before. And for sure, dentistry has benefited from this immensely and continues to do so. So for you, the students in the audience, and saying, where do I fit in here? When you look at all the different activities and what's going on, it really is a new time. And we've talked about it not only in education, not only in your uh, researchers. We need researchers here. We need educators. And we need clinicians all working together if we're going to move forward more rapidly than in the past. Fiscal challenges. I wish I could go th through this really quickly, because um, it's tough. But really, we've had a good year. When you look at the economy and where things are and the cuts to states, we have a great leader. Dr. Franz Francis Collins at NIH and his group, including our wonderful Dr. Larry Tayback, who moved on from the NIDCR and now is a deputy director, they're the ones that are really the voices. And if you've ever gotten a chance to listen to Francis Collins um, and how he presents, he can take a complex thing, talk about it in a very complex way, and at yet the same time reach the Congress and get their um, interest in this. So essentially, we weren't cut. Many of the other federal agencies were cut. We were not cut. There was a potential for an 8% cut across the board, if you remember, when we were going through all of this. And that would have been devastating. So NIH is receiving about $30.7 billion, not what they requested, but better than we thought. And NIDCR is at $110.7 million. So much, much better. And so I would say, OK, considering where the economy is. Now, let's look at it another way. And so this is the reality of it. 
So we go back to 1998. And the reason why I go back to 1998 is because that was the time when we were hoping in five years to see a doubling. And that was the dream at that time. NIDCR has not reached the doubling yet. Some of the institutes have, we have not. We're close. But when you look at this, the blue is the current funding. And so you could see it's not dropped, but it's gone steady. The problem with that is inflation has caught up. And so if you look at the purchasing power, and that's the red line, the purchasing power for the same amount of money is about around 200,000. So it costs more money to do research. We all know that from the staffing to I know my animal costs are huge. And so how do you run a lab? So we're doing this, but we recognize that there are significant issues. So yes, our budget is flat, but flat isn't good enough. And we're hoping that with the economy, it will move forward. So what are we doing to handle this issue? And so I think we're all working on um, the cure for funding cuts. I mean, that's something that all of us are trying to do. But one of the things that I think we as an um, institute look pretty good. And that's in terms of, if you look at the blue line, this is the success uh, rate for the uh, basic research um, program grants or pro research project grants. And if you look at the blue line, our average in 2011 for all the institutes is about 18%, with some of them in single digits in terms of funding. We are at about 23%. I'm sure some of you would like to see it at 30%, 35%. But 23 relative to the other institutes is not bad. And so I was discussing this with some people the other night. How are we managing that for, for in a variety of different ways? One of them is we're going more for R01s, individual program projects, rather than P grants and center grants where some people would say that those models work better, but they cost a huge amount of money. This way allows us to fund more individuals. In addition to that, we're doing some shorter grants and also some cuts with some of the grants that are in, in place. And so I think with these strategies, we've been able to fund more grants. So this is just visual of that. And so this is the 82% of our funding goes to the research uh, project grants. We're funding some centers, and of course, training is an important part of what we do in some contracts. But the majority is in those research um, project grants. So that's a little bit of an insight into the fiscal side. <clears throat> and now let's move on to the uh, strategic plan and uh, talk first about some of the basic science. And there's many, many different things going on at the Institute. This is one, just one way of representing the extramural portfolio. And it's way we, the way we code things. But I wouldn't get overly excited about one, your area of research being a little bit tinier than somebody's, because they really do overlap. It's just one way of coding it. I show this more for the students to just quickly look at the different areas that we are funding and to recognize that it's a really a pretty good um, breadth in terms of the portfolio. So the areas I'm going to talk about are cleft lip and palate, um, diagnostics, oral cancer, and the microbiome project. There are many other things I could talk about, but I've selected these. So cleft lip um, is create. These are all areas that were funded by NIDCR. So this is cleft lip corrected um, genetically in a mouse model. And what is very important here is there weren't models ideal models prior to this study that was in 2011. And the other thing is I have references on the bottom, but I'm not going to mention any individual people in fear of forgetting others. And so we're just going to move along with that. And um, I apologize if it's one of your studies and I don't mention your name. And so, um, so the researchers here developed a first multigenic most multigenic uh, mouse model of cleft lip, cleft palate. And how they do this, they knocked out this compound mutations in uh, PBX. 
And these are downstream wind pathway molecules that were all knocked out. And they got 100% cleft lip, cleft palate. This hadn't happened before. And so this is a very good model. In addition to that, in this model, you have um, interferon regulatory factor six, which is known to be a gene associated with cleft lip, cleft lip, cleft palate in humans. So it parallels the human side. And when they went back and they restored Wnt activity, they got 100% correction of the cleft lip, cleft palate. So we now have a model that is funded by NIDCR. Moving on to the translational side of these projects in cleft lip, cleft palate, I think we all know that this is one of the uh, most common defects, and there's strong evidence for genetic control. So in comes the genomic-wide association studies, and uh, we um, joined in that in the area of cleft lip, cleft palate, and in many other areas as well. In this particular case, um, a GWAS study was done on about um, about 20 countries, I think, and over 8,115 uh, people, individuals. So it's a good cohort. And what they found is um, variations in genes close to a transcription factor, MFAB, and a transmembrane factor, ABCA4. But in addition to that, they also confirmed in a mouse model that MAFB was important to early development of the palate. They also confirmed, showing that this GWA study was valid, that previously identified gene, as you saw from the wind pathway in the slide before, interferon regulatory factor six was identified, as well as a suspected segment of chromosome eight. So these are continuing um, studies um, that are moving forward. There is a clinical study currently being funded in this area to define when is the best time to inter intervene for cleft lip and cleft palate, and there are other clinical studies going on in this area as well. The next area I want to turn to a little bit is the diagnostics. And I know many of you, um, probably faculty, is this reality? Um, I've heard this for years and years and years in salivary diagnostics. When is it going to become reality? I would say that within five years, it will be in your private practice. Um, I really feel that the pilot studies that we have right now are pretty exciting. Not necessarily for the diagnosis of periodontal diseases or diseases of the oral cavity. More exciting in the areas of cancer biology in not only salivary diagnostics, but brush biopsies, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So I think there's some huge potential here, which means that in terms of education and education of the future, our students have to be prepared at the cell molecular level and also understand when to refer out to other patients, once, other uh, practitioners, once they have this information. So, um, this is a nano biochip, and this group of um, individuals are looking at acute myocardial infarct. They've already started some pilot projects in this area, and it's a clinical validation of four markers that they've identified, um, C-reactive protein, interleukin-1, myeloperoxidase, and myoglobulin. And they've shown that in myocardial infarct, you definitely see an increase in some of these proteins in a very small study. So we need to validate this in a larger study. But at the same time, they've been doing a parallel study in individuals having an emergency and having to get to the hospital. And so if they can do this in, while they're in the ambulance and if they know they're having an acute MI, they're going to treat those patients differently than other individuals. So I see this as a incredibly exciting um, early studies that there's absolutely no reason why this can't be ready in about five years. At the same time, this group is also using a similar nano biochip, which I don't have time to discuss, but using um, buccal swabs for early detection of head and neck uh, squamous cell carcinoma. I want to talk about another diagnostic as um, 
And this is um, with markers along the um, mTOR pathway uh, as biomarkers and also targeting therapies. So I think some of you in the audience uh, are well familiar with the mTOR pathway and the many signaling molecules that are involved in this pathway. Um, increase mTOR regula um, increases proliferation, cell survival, angiogenesis, and is identified as being um, increased expression in uh, certain types of cancers. And so one of the areas is um, head and neck cancer. It's the sixth most common cancer. And one of the problems with the survival, the survival rate, five years, about 50%, this is not good. And the general feeling is because it's diagnosed late. So the feeling was that if they could do these biopsies and identify, ah, so they do these biopsies to identify these proteins early on in the cancer, that would be a, a, an incredibly valuable test. So this is a group, it's our intramural program, it's our extramural program getting biopsies from all over. And so they put these uh, biopsies on a tissue microarray and mTOR is just one of the markers, there are many other markers that are currently being used as a potential for early diagnosis. And this is something that would be in your private practices. In addition to that, they're currently in clinical trial with inhibitors, rapamycin, inhibitors of the mTOR pathway to inhibit um, or to treat ca uh, head and neck cancers. Um, and that's early on, they're just recruiting patients with some potential success. Then in March is the Cancer Genome Project. This is a NIH-wide project. We are partnering with them, and one of the areas of focus is in oral cancer. And um, this uh, program was designed to develop a comprehensive catalog of genomic alterations associated with oral cancer. And they used high-throughput exome sequencing, and they identified NOTCH1 as a potential tumor suppressor gene mutation in about 15 percent of these head and neck cancers. Now, for some of you would say, so what? NOTCH1 has been identified. And in fact, in other diseases, this is AMB, there have been different areas, mutations that have been identified. But it had never been identified before in head and neck cancer, and these are just showing the various mutations in NOTCH1. It was reported by, in, NIH, uh, in science in 2011 by NIH, two NIH-funded uh, research groups, one uh, funded by NIDCR, and they confirmed each other's results. So that was pretty exciting to see the same results by two groups back-to-back -back in science. But in addition to that, beyond these genes that they identified, they also um, identified other genes that were tumor suppressor genes rather than oncogenes, suggesting that we need alternative therapies on different approaches than we currently have. So these are all very exciting preliminary results. The uh, group that we funded with only 33 tumors, that's really not enough. And so we need to validate the findings. And then, of course, the ultimate goal of these is to improve early diagnosis and also tailored treatment based on the identification of these genes and mutations that are involved in these diseases. The other I find um, incredibly exciting area is um, the uh, Human Microbiome Project. And this is an NIH Common Fund project. You should go on the website and take a look at these. These are areas that are funded across the NIH. They're called trans-NIH projects. We do not see enough people applying to these that are NIDCR-funded uh, individuals. So I really encourage you to take a look at the Common Fund. Um, but what was exciting here is we all know that um, we have cells that are ours. But in fact, the cells that are theirs, which are the um, microbes make up about 100 trillion and, in fact, tenfold greater than the us's. So there are a lot of those microbiomes in there that impact us. And if so, they impact living, they impact diet, they impact um, 
many other aspects. And so when we, so there is some studies on we are what we eat. And in fact, based on your diet, you have different microbes. And so what does this mean in understanding the whole physiology of an individual? So this is a very important area. It was started funding in 2007. And the data that has come out of this area is so exciting that we're going into a phase two of the um, human microbiome project. So stay tuned for some of that. And I hope you will apply for those of you that this is an area of interest. But as I've already just dis discussed, the goal is to characterize these many, many different sites and understand the uh, microbes in the different areas. In addition to the oral cavity, it's nasal passage, skin, GI tract, and UG tract. And um, the oral site has the most samples. There are nine different samples that are being evaluated there. And um, the ultimate goal is, as I said, is to understand the human biology better than ever before, because these microbes make up a large part of who we are and in health and disease. And it's already showing that there are certain microbes that we thought were just ours that, in fact, are identified in other tissues of the body. And in addition to that, some of the bugs that we thought were good bugs are actually bugs that help those more virulent bacteria get into um, tissues. So it's a very, um, very important and exciting information that we're finding from the study. So um, the other part of this, and so one of the areas is these, getting all this information, and how do you collect it? And so with the uh, human or micro microbiome database, they're putting these into a database, and anybody in the community can go to the site and learn from it. So there are about 600 species. These were previously uncultured and unnamed. In addition to that, the imaging side has helped us with the floor. This is a fluorophobe channel, which allows um, imaging of about 15 bacteria in that biofilm. And so now you begin, begin to understand how these different bacteria interact with each other. Very exciting uh, research area. What about public health challenges? There are many areas that we are currently funding. The areas I'm going to talk a little bit about are pain, health disparities, and the rise in HPV-associated all pharyngeal cancers. So this, I was very fortunate to walk into the NIDCR at a time when the IOM, the in Institute of All, Me of All Medicine, the Institute of Medicine a report, I think of everything in terms of dentistry, um, that it was just, just being published and just being launched. So it's an exciting time for us. And some of the statistics on this, you probably already know. So it affects a huge population of adults costs a lot of money. And the no-brainer, um, which was what the recommendation was, there are a bunch of other recommendations, but it's comprehensive and it's interdisciplinary. And those are the kind of approaches that are needed. We can't just look at face pain, temporal mandibular joint pain. And so the recognition that individuals that have one of these um, chronic pain situations or comorbid, they linked with others. So you have temporal mandibular joint, migraine headaches, myalgia, um, vulvodynia, uh, bowel, chronic bowel syndrome, chronic pelvic pain. These are all linked together. And most people that have one have another one as well. So what's going on here? And we need to talk together. And we at NIH are now at the table with these, owning these different parts, actually sitting and talking to, to the get together as a consortium about pain. And so at the same time, NIDCR was funding OPERA Act I. And so OPERA was uh, just published in the Journal of Pain. And you can read what it stands for. I, I like OPERA. It sounds nice. Um, and so it followed 3,200 pain-free individuals over three to five years. This is the first large study, prospective study, looking at um, a development of a disease. And there's some very interesting studies that we are going to continue to pursue. And so you'll see funding opportunities in these areas. 
The risk increases with age. There's no correlation with socioeconomic status. There are changes in some part of the nervous system that control pain. And importantly, there are mutations in genes known to be involved in stress, psychological well-being, and inflammation. So there are genetic links to these uh, situations as well. So where are the next steps? Obviously, cross-disciplinary. That's an easy one. Um, but we have to go back and define the molecular mechanisms of chronic pain. And then the transition from acute to chronic so we can stop at the acute level and not let it go to the chronic stage. We have to look at phenotype and genotype profiles of these cohorts of these co-occurring chronic pains, an important area of study. And obviously, the long-term goal is prevention, mechanism, mechanistic-specific diagnosis, and of course, treatment. So we do have some centers that we are funding in the health disparities uh, research area. There are many, many different areas that we can focus on. We have made some incremental changes, but not enough. And we are going to be looking at this in 2014, 2014, the new Health Disparity Center, what we're going to be funding will be uh, brought out. And we are just discussing now how we could make sure that we advance again more rapidly than we have in the past. The areas that we have been focusing on at NIDCR, again, this is a trans initiative, but NIDCR is caries, especially early childhood caries, periodontal disease, and oral pharyngeal cancers. Some of the areas where we've advanced, so we would like to make more advances, action advances versus just data collection. And one of the areas in policy changes are an important part of that advance. And so, they um, early on demonstrated that fluoride varnishes do prevent early caries, early childhood caries. And so now physicians in more than 37 states can receive funding for this. Hopes with that little bit that there'll also be both physicians and dentists linking together and recognizing disease in a much better fashion than they have in the past. The current programs are five centers. And they was, um, since 2008, we've been funding five centers. And all of these centers, the requirement is that they have an intervention. So it's not just collecting data. That was, you couldn't put in a proposal unless you had this intervention piece with it. For those in the audience, it's not just the centers. So the red dots are the centers, or stars. And the blue are the sites associated with those centers, so those are where the intervention studies are going. But we are beyond the centers also funding other research in that area, and those are the triangles. And the triangles have their sites as well, and those are the green. So it's a lot more than just the centers that are being funded in this area. The other area that's um, hi highlighted, and I bet you have been reading um, in the last few months is HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancer. And this is addressing HPV-related cancers, that it is really a pressing public health um, need. If you've been reading the literature on this, there's all evidence from this that, um, so the red line is about where the overall, this is incidence of oral pharyngeal cancers are. But you can see on the rise is HPV-positive oral pharyngeal cancers where there's a decline in those not associated with HPV. Probably the decline is associated with decrease in tobacco smoking is the reason for that. But what's going on here? And um, a more recent study that was published in 2012 in JAMA of that infection, oral HPV infection prevalence is at about 6.9% in the United States and that it's higher in men versus women and what's going on there. And so these are unknowns and NIH will be, NIDCR will be supporting um, research on incidents, risk factors, natural history, biology, and also what about the vaccine? Does it have any benefits in preventing um, the oral associated cancers? 
How about the translational side? What are we doing here? I'll talk a little bit about the practice-based networks, undiagnosed diseases, and inflammation. So the practice-based networks, for those of you that are not familiar with this, in our early round, we funded three sites or three areas where they were the hubs for these practice space, where they would do the epidemiology, the statistics, and help the dentists in the community do research. And so asking real important questions that impact your patients. So where the evidence was lacking and the dentists were wondering, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Going back to the universities and having the universities help them to design the research projects for the community. And I think there's some of those in the community, researchers out there that go, is this really working? You're putting a lot of money into it and what's happening? And I would say that it has many implications. One is students get excited about research that could be going out into practice because of these activities going. Dentists in the community, more than we ever expected, are excited about these projects. And they are addressing critical needs. And I'll give you one example. So there, but right now there are almost 1,000 practitioners and over 30,000 patients and 30 different studies going on. I don't have the time to talk about all these studies. And in fact, I, I had a lot more on them and I cut them uh, just for time. But one of the areas that right when these practice-based networks were launched, the information that the bisphosphonates, the drugs that are being used to treat um, osteoporosis, were causing osteonecrosis of the jaw. Um, at that time, the drug companies, when it was first investigated, know it's because these drugs are being used for cancer patients and they're high doses, and it has to do with the chemotherapy and it's not the drugs. Well, we quickly gathered NIDCR, I wasn't here at the time, <laughs> They quickly gathered the networks together to do a retrospective study on getting, gathering information on patients that were taking bisphosphonates and the incident of osteonecrosis. And I think it's history now, but you see these publications came out by having these cohorts, being able to go out to the dentists in the community and ask these questions. And the results were, that we all know, um, but we had to do the studies, that um, they suggest that while the overall risk is relatively low, it's definitely a risk factor. And in other studies, both IV as well as oral. Yes, the IV, much more higher incidence, but they're both associated with O and J. So this was an important finding and important evidence that we could use to help the drug companies. That's not to say this isn't a great drug. It is. But in terms of osteonecrosis of the jaw and being aware of it and being sensitive to it, and having patients, what do we do with patients that may be susceptible that are going to go on high doses of bisphosphonates for cancer? And so we needed to understand the basic mechanism. So at the same time we were funding this, we were also funding basic research in this area. And this gets a, a little complicated, and I will go through it quickly. Um, but we were very proud to see a as an, a, a research area funded by us on the bisphosphonates, making the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research cover. So the teeth made the cover of a bone journal. Um, and um, so that we needed rat models to try to understand the mechanism. And so one of the um, groups that we funded were able to, they used a ligature model in addition to induced periodontal disease, so they, an infection. So the question was, is infection and the drug sufficient enough to cause the disease? And so they exposed these animals to very high doses, IV, plus the um, infect periodontal disease infection. And all these animals developed ONJ. And so evidence that infection plus bisphosphonates is sufficient to cause osteonecrosis of the jaw. It doesn't answer why the jaw versus other tissues. Um, but maybe it's because of the local infection there. But one of, it was absolutely beautiful. If you go back and look at this article, I love the way they took the rat tissue and then they took a human patient and showed that the model is really working because this lesions were strikingly similar. In a, um, another study um, 
that was also funded by us. They um, did an extraction model and they made the animals vitamin D deficient. And they found that the animals that were vitamin D deficient were much more susceptible to osteonecrosis of the jaw. And in another study in, um, recently published in the Journal of Dental Research in 2011, they were doing a totally other different clinical study. And, but they found wh whether they were the control or the treated patients, that those individuals that were vitamin D deficient follow up a year later, radiograph evidence of decrease in healing of the intrabony defects. So what does this mean for us as clinicians? Should we be monitoring vitamin D uh, levels in our patients before they go through surgeries? Should we be looking at other profiles of our patients than what we do now? And I would say absolutely yes, but we have to get these policies and guidelines in place so that it changes and we have a much more biological approach to the way we treat our patients. So what are we doing with the PBRNs? Um, these are, we're, we're going to have one. I can't tell you where, or what, or how. And then we'll have these regional nodes because it hasn't yet gone out for release yet. And the goal is to build on the current investments that have been made and to have a much broader scope than is currently involved with these practice-based networks. I have a few more, well, a couple of more slides here, and I'm looking at the time, but I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> so just relax a little bit, guys. And so, um, <laughs> so another area that, um, so we have an undiagnosed program at um, NIH, and this is very exciting. These are projects with our intramural program and also our extramural people are involved in this research. So here's two uh, um, sisters that came in to the undiagnosed program. In brief, they had a progressive debilitating joint disease, um, peripheral calcification in the hands and the feet, but not the heart, and they came to the undiagnosed program. And through SNP analysis and also sequencing, they were able to identify a mutation in a gene called NT5E. So what does that mean? That mutation ended up regulating a protein called CD73. And CD73 converts AMP to adenosine. And adenosine, this is their hypothetical working model, inhibits um, tumor, tumor, tissue um, nonspecific alkaline phosphatase that regulates that wonderful balance of pyrophosphate to phosphate. And so without that, they have this phosphate buildup. We were interested, what are these patients look so, it's a new disease, arterial calcification, and they're still studying this pathway and trying to prove it. But we were interested in what do these patients look like? So patient came by um, about a month ago and we were able to get a Panorex. And I remember when I was at Michigan, one of our wonderful radiologists kept stressing, look at the Panorex, look at the Panorex. And if you can see here, there's a, in the parapharyngeal space, there's ectopic calcification. We're trying to go back because these uh, patients weren't identified until they were teenagers of so trying to get early, earlier Panorexes because one of them had orthodontic treatment we haven't been successful, but wouldn't that be interesting? A very important area. The other area is hormonal regulation. And this is important for us because I think as clinicians, we need to look at hormonal profiles of our patients. This is a patient that has a deficiency in FGF23 for a variety of reasons. FGF23 is made by your bones. It's made by your osteoblasts and osteocytes. It acts on the kidney to excrete phosphate. If you're not excreting phosphate, you're building up phosphate, that phosphate power phosphate ratio, and they get this ectopic calcification. But that ectopic calcification is mush bone. It's not very, very good bone. Looking clinically, and some of this has been published, but this was a patient. Now these, the clinicians are referring, the MDs are referring back to our clinical practice in the dental institute. And you can see what's wrong with this picture. Anyone see what's wrong? Students, what's wrong with that picture? There are no pulp chambers. They're all calcified. And then in addition to that, we see this hyper or maybe hypercementosis and root resorption. So 
being careful diagnosticians, older individuals, they have FGF problems, they have chronic diseases, what about your implants? Should be, should be getting a better profile than you do now. The other area that's very exciting is um, the inflammatory pathway. And recognizing in about 2005, these lipoxin, resolvins, and protectins are very critical in modulating inflammation. And so they affect, so you're en endogenously, you make these. At, uh, three omega uh, polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acids are actually why they're good, is because your body breaks those down into these wonderful protective molecules, but they move quickly. So if we could stabilize those molecules, um, perhaps they could be used to treat pain, to treat inflammation. And it's right now in preclinical trials in a stabilized form of lipoxin, and with the goal of using it to treat early on gingivitis to see toxicity, but it's in early stages in animal models right now. We're hoping to eight months or so to get it into clinical trials. Strengthening the, pi pi the um, pipeline. This is for students of way back in 1981. This is where we were in terms of uh, getting your first grants and moving along, and I know it's taking a longer time. So what we're doing now, there are a variety of NIH initiatives as well as NIDCR initiatives. The time is running out. This is on your website. You can get this information, so I'm going to go through it very quickly. There are many, many different examples. One is the Alaska Clinical Award. This is at NIH. Dentists and medical students, graduates, can take the opportunity here. It's a five to seven year program, and it's to increase the number of clinical researchers. And so after that, to five to seven years, you can stay an additional at NIH or move out into um, a community, into an academic environment. These transformative R1s, these are available for anybody. These are high initiative um, collaborative awards. You have these pioneer awards. These are creative individuals. Um, and then the innovative award, which is for new investigators. And then, of course, these Jumpstart Awards that you've probably heard about, of um, early independence for unusual, unusual projects. At NIDCR, we are, do, we are following this. We have from, following from the graduate dental student all the way to your senior with a variety of T awards and F awards and K awards and uh, really trying to work on helping you to launch your careers. I encourage you to... Um, speak to the extramural staff, who I'll introduce you to in a few more slides. And so we also have some other awards, again, a K-22 and a K-12. Please take a look at these. And then go to the website. And I had this sort of bit interactive, but this is a good website. And for the students especially, if you want to find out about grants and funding, you can go to this table. If you want to find out about research, you can move here. If you find a specific area of interest, it's amazing the information that's available for you. If you're going to the AADR, even if you're not going, and you're going to be talking to these people on the phone, there are many individuals under our extramural research program. You need to get to know the person that's involved in your area. They want to help you. They're sitting there waiting, and they're PhDs, DDS PhDs. They know the research. They are very bright people, and they love our extramural program. They're very <coughs> proud of it. You need to get to know them. And then we have the extramural activities that is, runs our grants area, but they also run our career development. And I know many of you know Ken, Kevin Hardwick. He's very excited of his retirement, which is March 1st, and he's moving to Texas and building this house. We already saw the breakdown of it. But Lynn King, <laughs> Lynn King is moving into that. She's been with us for a long, long time, and she's just moving into another area as well as Leslie Frieden, who's un under her. And I think this is going to be a great group. And then for our intramural program, we have intramural, intramural opportunities, both for the summer and longer term. And Deborah Phillip is involved in that, or Philip. And so what I've discussed today um, is a little bit of where we're going. And important to stay at the discovery but there's so many opportunities all around of open areas and open fields. This is really a very, very extraordinary time for science because of all the advances. And I hope the 
researchers that have been actively involved continue to be, and also we get that new generation um, coming in as well. So in summary, um, it's therapeutics, diagnosis, risk prevention, and <laughs> we want here. So with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity. Take it from you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McCauley. So I have another 10 slides on that that I had to remove, um, but it is a very important issue. So there are a few things that um, NIDCR is doing. First, the report was just for straight PhDs, and it was, or MDs. It forgot about the DDS PhDs or the PhDs in our uh, portfolio. So six months ago when this came out, or maybe it was four months ago, um, in science, we immediately asked for the NIH to give us information, and they have the database on what about, what does NIDCR look like? How does our advancement along the pathways in these different areas? And I know there's an issue. I mean, you could look around in academia and you could see there's an issue. But what is it and what does it look like for dentistry? We are still waiting for them to gather that information. And so uh, we were told we'd get it at the end of February. And the plan after that was to make phone calls to several individuals um, out in the community and also to get a small workshop together at NIDCR because it is a problem and we have to deal with it, but we need to show the people that we bring in for a workshop or people we call on the phone, we need the data and we don't have NIDCR's data and so that is part of the problem. But, yeah. Imagine tomorrow was a magical day and you woke up and you had a lot more money. Okay, and you've got three options. You could just increase the funding for all the current parts of the portfolio, or you might be able to pick something that you just love and you want to <coughs> fast track. But there might be something out there that you're thinking about that isn't on the table yet, that you really think deserves special attention. Well, what are your thoughts? All of the above? All of the above. <laughs> so, you know, the question here is if I had tons of money, um, what direction would I take? Would I just give more money to the people that have it? Or um, go in new directions? Or are there any specific areas that I have? So I think we're doing okay. And I think there is an opportunity. And I think every new director that has come in has had an area that they're going to put a little bit of money aside. I need to make sure I discuss this with the intramural people. Be, so if I was just a researcher talking to you, I could talk to you about my projects and where I think they're going. At NIDCR, the intramural program needs the conversation first, and we're just beginning to discuss that and see for 2014 if there are some new initiatives. And I have to get everybody on board there before I go tell you, and then you go tell NIDCR. <laughs> that wouldn't be very nice. So um, stay tuned, but I do think that even in times like this, you can't just like when you have budget cuts at university, if you just sat with your budget cuts and didn't think of innovative things, you'd be five years behind rather than five years ahead. So I think there are some new areas um, that have to be focused and maybe one or two, um, and you'll be hearing about them, so. Here's time for one more question. Dr. Fribley. Dr. Summers, thank you for coming home. My Where are you? No. <laughs> You're not home. The, um, and your spectrum of uh, different award mechanisms for NIDCR, I noticed that you had R21 on there. And some institutes are doing away with this. Can you tell us what's on the horizon for R21 for NIDCR? 
Um, so the question is, where are the R21s these days? Um, and again, I had to take some slides away that um, based on the data that I am seeing, um, that we continue to fund RO3s and R21s. I worry a little bit about that delaying people of getting their RO1s. And I think the NIDCR extramural pro program has been very careful of trying to fund the R21s that are innovative rather than just somebody having R21s for the rest of their life and never moving into the RO1. So I see it as a mechanism for some of the innovative projects. And I think it would be a shame to take it away based on the information I have right now. So I'm thinking we're going to continue it. So. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very, very much. <laughs>